Hello students, I'm glad that you could join and watch this video. I'm going to talk about the analytics project here. I'm going to walk through all stages of it. To get the resources you need for the analytics project, go to our eCampus course page. Uh, the sidebar to the left has a link called analytics project. Click on that and this is what it's going to look like. The first component here is where you download the project file with the questions. And this is also where you submit. Also note that there are other resources that I post down below. All of these resources are also embedded in this file, but this is considered a backup system. For example, you can see videos here. You can see a direct link to the Wharton Research Data Service. And here's a file you can use to select your company. It's an Excel file format. You can click on that and review some companies. What you're looking for is a large data set. You want enough records to do correlation analysis, regression, and a line chart. So let's click on the assignment. We will cover the first third of it today, data retrieval, calculations, and distributions. To complete the project stage, you will need to go into the Wharton Research Data Services. I will call it words throughout the semester. You click in there and you log in using this login information. This is going to be supported by a video that will step you through this process. This video is in YouTube and it is very close to exactly what you need to do. There are some exceptions to that. For one, you will use a different company that is used in this video. To select your company, go into the words interface and select a company having one of these SIC codes. This will take quite a bit of research for you to learn the interface. So if you wanna skip that, just go to the file, established corporations in words, CompuStat quarterly that is available from the link that I just showed you. You can select your company from there, but if you wanna use the interface to select an acceptable company, we are gonna focus on IT generating firms as opposed to IT using firms, you would use one of these SIC codes. So select this string, copy it, and you can use that to select any company from any one of these SIC codes. Again, probably the simplest way to select your company is just to go to this file, look at one that's large enough to study. Once you've selected your IT generating firm, you're ready to extract data. When you are in words extracting your data, here is the data that I want you to go and select. Your primary task is to explain the historic behavior of your company's price earnings ratio, which is a metric for determining how over or underpriced the company is. This will serve as the basis for understanding relationships between firm value as represented by the PE ratio and potential causes. One important cause might be research and development. Another is the size of the company. So these are variables that we may consider as influences to the PE ratio. To calculate your PE ratio in words, CompuStat, you will need these three variables, common shares used to calculate earnings per share, retained earnings, price close for the quarter. And these are the mnemonic names for these variables that you will see in words. In order to calculate the PE ratio, use this following formula. I will show you how to do this in Excel if you are unfamiliar with Excel formulas. We are also interested in the causes of firm value. So this is the variable for research and development expense, XRDQ. We're going to standardize it by revenue so that the size of R&D does not obscure our results. To do this, we simply take R&D and divide it by total revenue. Here is the mnemonic name for total revenue in words copy stat. Also read about your company, learn about it, especially the dates of key events that may have influenced PE ratios, because that will be useful on our line chart later. You can also go and find other accounting metrics, such as R&D or revenue, that may be useful in predicting the value of the PE ratio. Feel free to be creative, and that will be something that I can appreciate. So again, the above process may be iterative. Once you have your data, you always wanna download it from words into Excel file format, which is an option at the bottom. 
You'll see that in the video above that I mentioned. Don't feel frustrated if you have to iterate back through this process because you should expect for this to be a learning curve. You will become more and more familiar with the interface the more you use it. It's just a part of doing research. We're also going to cover distribution. Here is the normal distribution. Distributions are never perfectly normal. We will have to deal with non-normality to some extent. To assess that, we will look at skewness, which is a formula in Excel also, and kurtosis. Here's an overview of skewness and kurtosis. Skewness has to do with how long the tail is. Positive skew means the tail is pronounced on the positive side of the timeline. Negative skew is the opposite. And no skewness means it's a symmetrical distribution. Kurtosis has to do with the height of the distribution. Both lead us to understand a little bit about the extent of non-normality in the variable distribution. To calculate these, we use skew and curt functions, and also we can use average to get an idea of central tendency. We can do this for all variables that we use with ease. Also, we may want to transform if we have severe non-normality. We can use percent rank to transform to uniform, and we can apply the invnorm, which is the inverse normal function, to that in order to approximate a normal distribution. I'm going to show you how to do this in a video here, which, as you see, is highlighted in yellow because that video does not exist as of the creation of this video. We transform to uniform or normal to mitigate outliers. Okay, so what we're doing is preparing our data for our tests of linear association, which are correlation and regression. And we are going to talk about that in our next video. So that's an overview of what we're going to do in this video. Let's go back up. We already have our data. There's a video showing you how to go and get the data. You can select your company from the list, or you can play around with the user uh, interface in words to find a company that has one of these SIC codes. Once we feel comfortable, we have enough data for our company then we can go and proceed toward data extraction. At a minimum, you'll want the variables that are shown in this document. Again, feel free to add to these variables. So I have selected Apple Corporation as my company, and I have downloaded this data from Words on Apple. And here it is. You go to the left. You can see that the system gave me more information than I really needed. I'm going to hide much of this data. Right-click on selected columns and click on hide. And again, just press control, click on any column that you're not interested in viewing, right click at the heading and hide. And now we can more easily view the pertinent data that's useful in this exercise. Go back to the assignment. We are interested in calculating the PE ratio using this formula. So let's create a column to store PE ratio, PE ratio. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see it. So to calculate this ratio, it's going to be equals price, which is missing for the first four records, divided by open parentheses, earnings, retained earnings, divided by number of shares. For my data set, that is S2 divided by open parentheses, O2 divided by N2, close parentheses. Your data set may vary depending on how you collected the data. So it's not really likely that you're going to use that exact formula. But as long as you have price divided by earnings divided by shares outstanding, use the calculation that's in the assignment. As you can see, we have a problem. There is no price close, so there's no numerator in this formula. So what I'm going to do is create a missing value where that's the case. So I'm going to say if this value equals null value. In other words, if there's nothing there, then ignore the calculation by posting a null value. Otherwise, do the formula. In other words, if there's something there, go ahead and do the calculation. And there's the formula for that. Now my zero has gone away. I can double click this little handle at the bottom right and it will copy all the way down. As you can see, the data does not have the same decimal places for all values. So I'm going to change that, select all of it, format cells. I want there to be three decimal places, and now it is more appealing to view. In fact, you know what? All of our data is kind of like that. Let's select on our numerical data and do the same thing.
three decimal places. So there is our PE ratio. And you can see at some points in time, it's high. Other times it's low. I'll leave the interpretation to you. And so remember, there's a theory that research and development may cause the PE ratio to fluctuate, but research and development is confounded by the size of the company. So what we really need to do is standardize it by dividing it by revenue. And note that there's a lot of missing data here, so we're going to have to filter out or exclude where data is missing. Let's create the column heading. We'll call that RD underscore revenue. The reason we use underscore is when we handle data, send it from one system to another. For example, I may use this in SPSS later. You can't use certain characters, but the underscore is universally accepted with few exceptions. So let's calculate the standardized form of R&D. That's equals R&D expense divided by revenue. Again, we have a pesky zero that shouldn't be there. We're going to filter out this value again using logic. If R&D, in this case, it's column Q. Again, this may differ from your data set. If it equals null value, then we want to return a null value. Otherwise, perform the calculation. So this is what the formula looks like here. To copy it down, we can double click on this handlebar. And now you can see wherever R&D is a blank, so is our calculation. We don't have any error messages. Now let's select on all of this data. Let's again make it three decimal places. We'll make it number, format, three decimal places. And now it looks pretty again. Okay, let's go back to the assignment. And now what we need to do is evaluate the distributions of the variables of interest. We're going to look at skewness, kurtosis, and its average. This is considered metadata, and so we're not interested in creating a new column here. So let's create space for this metadata for each variable. We're going to select the top three records, and we're going to insert records. And I like to color code. So let's color code the variables that we're really working on in red so that they stand out. We're interested in skewness, kurtosis, and the average. So to calculate skewness for each variable, you use at skew, open parentheses, and you go and select the relevant data, in this case, PE ratio. Notice that I selected missing values, which is acceptable. I will not create an error message. And there we have the skewness. Kurtosis is equally simple at CURT, open parentheses, and then select the variable. Average is also simple. At average, and then select the exact data series. In this case, it's T5 to T171. Close parentheses, and there we have it, and we can use our standard convention of three decimal places. And conveniently, we can calculate the same metadata about the distributions for R&D standardized. Select these values and simply copy them over using our handlebar. So let's interpret these results. First, the average for the PE ratio centers around 11.9. This means in quarters, where Apple Corporation experienced PE ratios of greater than this value, then perhaps it was overpriced. Another way to interpret this is that investors were so optimistic about Apple that they drove the PE ratio up. An example of this is in its early years after the IPO. Another way of interpreting a really high PE ratio is that what if earnings dove down dramatically one term, such as during the pandemic? Let's look at the later years for Apple Corporation. In fact, as you can see, during the pandemic, the P.E. ratio shot up. This is probably due to low earnings during that period. Or this could be interpreted as investor optimism because during the pandemic, people became more connected and used their mobile devices, networks, and cloud services more. So you can see that the P.E. ratio can be interpreted in different ways at different points in time. It's also interesting to think about periods 
when Apple's PE ratio was lower than the average. So this value is actually useful, especially when you draw your line chart with markers. Let's interpret the normality diagnostics, skewness and kurtosis. Skewness should be centered around zero. We can see that with the PE ratio, that is not really the case. Kurtosis should be centered around three. And also with the PE ratio, that is not the case. It appears that the PE ratio is very non-normal. On the other hand, R&D divided by revenue appears to not deviate too much from zero for skewness and three for kurtosis. But because kurtosis does deviate from three in the negative direction, we will also consider this to be non-normal. So according to these diagnostics, what I've highlighted in yellow appears to be non-normal. So we will consider both of these variables to be non-normal, and we will transform them to mitigate outliers in order to make our results more consistent when we do correlation and regression. So going back to the analytics project, let's transform these variables to normal. And in the process, we will also transform them to uniform because that would be the first step. So to do this calculation, there are two arguments, and you have to be careful because one of them requires freezing values. And I'll explain that. I'll show you how to do that. We'll call this uni PE. And this is the uniform version of the PE ratio. In other words, the distribution is going to be ranked and therefore it will look like a rectangle or what I call a cake. The formula is at percent rank, open parentheses, and you want to select the entire series for the variable, comma, and the actual value. Close parentheses, enter. And you can see there's an error. There are two things we have to do to fix this. One is we will use the if error function, which has two arguments. If error, this first argument is, what if there's not an error? Go ahead and do the calculation. If there is an error, then apply a null value. And we separate the two arguments with a comma. So that fixed it. Now we're ready to copy down, except there's one problem. If we copy down, Excel is going to roll through these values and copy them down. It's going to add a 1 to this T5 and a 1 to the T171. It's going to shift the data range that we're really interested in down as we copy down. So we can't do that. So what we need to do is select on the data range that we're interested in. And we're going to freeze. I pressed F4 on your computer. It might be function F4, maybe something else. But you see, I put dollar signs before the T, before the number five, which is the row number, before the T on the second part of this reference and before the 171, which is the bottom, referencing the bottom uh, row. So this freezes this reference. And when I press enter, it has the same meaning, but now I can double click on this handle, copy down, and every time I reference, or every time I try to transform an individual value, this reference of T5 to T171 remains exactly the same. Now, the last thing I need to do is to standardize the decimal places. I go to format cells, number, and we want three decimal places. That's our standard. And that variable is complete with one exception. And that is if you scroll and look for where one is, in this case, it's the last record. In other words, this last value is the largest value. This is gonna be a problem when you try to enter this information into the second step of normality transformation, this has to be a fraction or a probability. So what we'll do for the sake of simplicity, we could go into a lot of detail here. We'll just make this a 0.99 and that'll make it work. We could get more complicated, but this is not a data science class. Now let's go and create the uniform version of R&D, unit R&D. Easy enough, we can copy this formula to the right. But actually, if we did this, it would still focus on PE ratio, right? So if we select on this, look at this, it's selecting the PE ratio to evaluate. We don't want to do that. If we copy to the right, remember these references are frozen. 
So we need to unfreeze them before we copy over to the right so that it will go and grab R&D instead of PE. To do this, you simply take out the dollar sign to the left of each column reference. See the T? We actually really didn't need that. We were just doing that to go fast. So if you'll notice the T, when we copy to the right, the reference to T becomes a reference to U. But the reference to 5, when we copy down, will stay exactly the same. Now we can double click, and this will be accurate. Scroll down and look at that. Again, we have a decimal space problem. Format cells, three. Okay, so now we've calculated the uniform version of PE and R&D. Remember, we still have a one in R&D. We need to go get it, find it, and convert it to a 0.99 to make this work. And here it is, 0.99. It's an approximation of the one, but it will be useful in the next formula. So now we're going to do normality transformations. We'll call this norm PE and norm RD. To produce a normalized distribution for PE and R&D, we use the norm env function. That is N-O-R-M, I-N-V. It has three arguments. First is the probability. In this case, we're working on PE ratios. We use the result of the first step where we transform to uniform. And we also can use the mean, which as you can see is in T3 here. We could do this, but let's not do that. Let's standardize our value so that we can compare extreme values of PE ratios to R&D. This will be useful in charting. So z-scores always have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. We have an error. So what we will do is we will filter out erroneous results. If error, and then if it's an error, we have a null value. Let's copy these values down, double click on the handle, and there you have it. It looks like values range from roughly negative three to three and are centered on zero. Conveniently, we can copy this formula over to the right and get the same thing for norm R and D. If you scroll down again, it appears that our values center around zero. And we can check this easily. First of all, I'm going to change the decimals. We can check our assumption that the means or averages for each of these variables. And let's color code again. We can see if these averages are near zero. So let's copy this formula and we'll be able to paste it over to see. Yes, they do center around zero. And you know what? The uniform distribution should center around 0.5 because they're a probability from zero to one. And they do. So our results look valid. Okay, so you see what I'm saying? These two are probabilities, and they should center around 0.5, and they do. These two should center around zero, and they do. So we think our calculations are correct. It's important to validate our calculations. Let's go back and look at the assignment. We've done our normality transformation, uniformity transformation. We are now ready for tests of linear association and the final stage of line charting. Those sections will be the subject of future videos. Thanks for watching.